Okay, uh, welcome everybody to our webinar this month. Uh, this is a big month for us here at Cockroach Labs as we have made a recent release of Cockroach DB, uh, version 19.1. Uh, some of you may remember us with uh, a different set of versioning numbers. Uh, we've moved on, I actually had a pretty popular blog post about how we've actually moved to uh, kind of a more temporal approach to our, to our, um, our versioning number. So that's like 2019 release one kind of is the way you kind of look at it here. But um, so we're excited to, to talk today about uh, this release. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, first of all, uh, in the Zoom meeting here, um, if you have any questions during the, the webinar, please enter them into the QA panel. I'll be monitoring, monitoring them um, all along the way. Uh, and we'll, we'll interject them throughout uh, as, as, as necessary where they fit. Um, and then at the end of the webinar, uh, we're gonna conduct a, a quick survey um, the webinar should end and it should redirect you to a page, but we're going to give you a link at the very end in the chat window as well, which will help you kind of link to that. Please, please um, provide us feedback. Um, you know, Nate and I and, and, our, and our team here really want to get better and better every time we do these things and want to make them more useful for people. So that, that feedback is really great. And then, of course, yes, the recording will absolutely be available after the event. Um, we'll have it live on our site. We'll, we'll send it to everybody who's registered and and all attendees as well. But first of all, it's thank you for joining us. And again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, I like to actually, so your presenters today are, we're gonna go live for this just for a second so you don't have to look at this the whole time, but I'm Jim. Hey, I'm Nate Stewart. And so Nate is the VP of product here at Cockroach Labs, and I am the VP of product marketing. I'm gonna do the marketing slides and then Nate. I'll uh, be here with a uh, live demo, some exciting new functionality. So that's actually the good stuff. So I'll get through the slides and then we'll get to like the really good tech. We got a really good demo here for you. So um, I'm not gonna make you guys look at us though. So I'm gonna turn off video. Thank you so much. All right, so, um, so just to give kind of a foundational background of kind of what we're doing here at Cockroach Labs and, and why this release is very important to us. Um, you know, we've been building for just over four years um, a distributed SQL database. And when we think about distributed SQL here at Cockroach Labs, we really believe this is kind of the evolution of the database. You know, this is net new. This is something that was built from the ground up to be cloud native, right? This is built for microservices and distributed systems. Um, but it also fits the needs of, you know, legacy databases as they move to the cloud. And how do we migrate to the cloud? And how do we take advantage of the durability and the the scale that you find, the efficiencies of the, of the cloud. And so, you know, for us, those are the things that we're focused on here at Cockroach Labs. And when we think about roadmap and we think about, you know, where we need to be uh, release to release, we're, we, that's what we have in mind. Um, well, the way we define distributed SQL is, well, first of all, it's SQL. So there needs to be a standard SQL interface. And there's lots of things we did in this release around that. Um, we need to ease um, scale. Like, we understand that scale is a big piece of the cloud, you know, e either elastic or just general linear scale, and we don't wanna add complexity to that. So we focus on that as well. Um, Geo-replicated is a, is a key feature of you know, what we focus on, and that, that means you know, more than one data center. Oh, we're good within one data center and we'll be distributed in a single data center, but you know, making sure that you know, distributed transactions can, in, can happen in, in, in a geo-replicated environment, multiple different um, um, regions is important for us. And I think important for distributed SQL and of course being always on and resilient. And then of course, asset compliant, uh, you know, serializable isolation from a consistency level for, for all transactions. And something we do here that, that we love, uh, which is tying data to a location. So being able to geo-partition data as well. And so, you know, we focus on these things across our entire platform so we can actually put forth this kind of unique distributed architecture. You know, at the core of what we do is this is is our whole database. And we'll come back to that in a second, but you know, we can we can now deliver distributed SQL so we can coordinate consensus of queries and transactions across global scale. But we can also do this in a single data center as well. It isn't always that it's it's global, right? Um, we can automate the replication, repair, and rebalancing of of nodes as they go down or up, right? And and you know, as we scale out or or something fails, right? And so that resiliency becomes a big thing. And then attaching a location and being ultimately an inherent multi-cloud solution are, is one of the key reasons why people actually uh, choose to, to go with CockroachDB. I mean, implementing a single database that, that spans across multiple different clouds, pretty cool, right? Um, and so, you know, we're real proud of these sort of things, but this unique distributed architecture and this global coordination is really all enabled by the way in which we've architected um, CockroachDB 
um, in that any single node really is a complete instance of the database. I mean, it is you know our binary running on a, a particular machine. Um, and in that is not just the data, but it's all this global coordination stuff that allows it to be distributed. But some of the key features around, you know, integration, um, you know, how do we manage these things? Security, uh, you know, always, always uh, making sure that we have SQL coverage and how do we, you know, how do we optimize queries? You know, I was out with a DBA last night where we were talking about, you know, distributed systems and how do you actually kind of start to, how do we have insight into transactions uh, from a traditional point of view, say in an Oracle or, or SQL Server, these sort of things, how does that work in distributed environment, right? How do we optimize queries? We do a lot of focus here, there on, on that because we understand that, you know, distributed SQL, I think, uh, you know, what goes hand in hand with being distributed is performance, right? We aren't gonna change the nature of physics, right? Like light has speed, and I don't know how long it takes for a, a photon to go around the planet, but we can't fix that. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna shoot to be as close to that performance as possible um, in in a dis, in a distributed database. And so, lots of things that we do around locality and and geolocation uh, and, and 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 geo distribution. But I think a lot of things that we've done in the cost based optimizer, um, which I think Nate's gonna, I, mean, I don't want to like foreshadow him and ruin it, but Nate's gonna kind of go through some of the things we've done in the cost based optimizer to. Uh, to kind of improve that sort of stuff. But, you know, we focus across this entire stack. You know, we've, like I said, we built this distributed SQL database. We have lots of things that we're doing, but for us, it's, it's how do we become a complete database that's, that's really gonna be trusted and, and, and right for, you know, enterprise adoption. And enterprise adoption, as we all know, um, does need to meet all the, the quote, illities that are important, right? Uh, all the, the management and the security stuff. And so, we focus lots of things around there and we've done some, we've added some key features that are kind of related to that in our most recent release. Um, three of the, the, the main features of which we, we, we have added is, you know, integration with like security directories. So using GSS API so that we could, you know, integrate via LDAP and Active Directory. So we can now authenticate users uh, relative to corporate governance and security policy um, and then use that within the cluster. We kerberize the cluster so we can actually do that. I think we kerberized in the last release and then, then the GSS API stuff we added this release uh, for authentication. So um, a big feature, um, something that I think uh, in any mind of an enterprise uh, evaluation or usage of a database, you know, this stuff has just got to be there. Um, we've also added some uh, and extended some of our key features around um, change data capture. Um, change data capture being able to capture changes in your database and then route them to explicit locations for consumption or inception in another part of the enterprise, whatever that is, um, a key feature. We're seeing kind of a reference architecture here emerge with, with, with Cockroach for sure, with CockroachDB, where you know, organizations are using us as a system of record for say a financial ledger or inventory management or even kind of like identity, identity access management, right? They wanna just actually have one consistent store um, but then they want to run analytics somewhere else. Like they want to use their OLAP database to, to run analytics. And we're seeing a lot of usage and a kind of a, an architecture start to emerge where people are using us, they're using CDC, they're dumping data into a Kafka sync, which we've added as a, and I, I believe we are certified by Confluent on the Confluent. Kafka sync, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, a certified Kafka sync and so, and then using Kafka to then redirect out to whatever it is, uh, your, your EDW of choice, be a BigQuery or Snowflake or, or whatever, whatever you're gonna use out there, right? Or uh, really any, any direction, right? Um, and then also to S3, right? Yeah, to cloud storage. So yeah, to cloud storage. Yeah, S3 or um, Google. Um, we can dump the uh, CDC updates directly there and cool. your data warehouse can be built on top of that. Yeah, so you could even just go direct, right? Forget forget Kafka, right? To right to cloud storage. So, um, so those were two key capabilities that uh, you know we kept running into as kind of requests. And so, you know, listening to customers, listening to kind of the the enterprise kind of requests around certain capabilities uh, is kind of what I you know I'm I'm proud to work with the product team here because I've never seen a product team so engaged with a uh, with a set of customers as as we've seen here at Cockroach Lab. So. Um, and then finally, uh, we've made some pretty significant advances with our cost-based optimizer. We originally um, launched this last October or September. When was the last release date? It was October, right? October. Yeah. Yeah, it was a big one in October. I think we did website and everything, right? So, um, and so we, we started with the cost-based optimizer back then. It was largely, you know, we had parts of it were still heuristic. 
um, and, and, not, and less based on statistics and everything. We've actually cured all. I mean, this release, we've, we've moved away kind of from, from heuristics in there. Um, and now we're basically all statistical and all, all analytical, correct? Yep, that's correct. So we do automatic stats uh, creation. So um, we can look at the structure or the nature of the data inside your database and use that to inform the, the plans that we, we pick. And not to foreshadow anything, but yeah, that's what we're going to see here in the demo, right? Exactly. It's awesome. All right. Well, with that, here we go. Now it's all made. I just kick back as the marketing guy and just watch. <laughs> okay, cool. So um, for this demo, I'm going to cover some of the exciting new features in CockroachDB 19.1. And I'm going to do this in the context of Mover, our favorite fictional peer-to-peer -peer vehicle sharing app. Uh, the way it works is you have users. Um, they can add vehicles to the community and other users can check those vehicles out, ride them around, and then drop them off uh, someplace else in the, in the city. And um, let's quickly talk about the structure of Mover's CockroachDB cluster. So they're using a nine node configuration. They have three nodes in US East, three nodes in US Central, and three nodes on the West Coast. And this is one of many patterns for CockroachDB, but they, they chose this pattern for two important reasons. The first is that they wanted to make sure that they could survive an availability zone failure. So if the AZ goes down, they wanna make sure that there's no user impact. They can really deliver this always on service. But the, the second big um, reason they structured their cluster this way is because they wanted all of the mover users to have a local experience. So if they have a, a user who's on their mobile device on the West Coast, they want to make sure those requests don't have to do a round trip to US East in order to start a ride or to add a vehicle to the pool. So this is going to let them deliver um, essentially local experience, even though we have this geo distributed cluster. And what, what Mover is doing here highlights an important point about CockroachDB. It's a very flexible system and we have many different design patterns for getting the resilience and the performance characteristics that, that you need in your application. So let's talk about two of the patterns that the Mover team is using today. So again, the goal is to get local performance while still having globally consistent data. So we can look at this basically by data type. So the Mover team has certain data that has an affinity to a certain geographical uh, region. You can think about the rides, the users, the vehicles. Those all tend to take place in a, in a single city. And the Mover team wanted to make sure that for those tables, they can get very fast reads and uh, very fast writes, all while maintaining uh, uh, a strongly consistent view of the data. So for this demo, that's already done. That's taking advantage of a feature called geopartitioning, and they're already getting local reads and writes for this type of, um, for these types of tables. But you know, the Mover team isn't happy with just the state of their current app. They want to start adding new features. And the big request that came from their, their marketing team is this idea of uh, promo codes. Um, promo codes are, are tricky for Mover because this data doesn't have any geographical affinity, right? Uh, it's a nationwide campaign, spring sale, uh, 19 is just as likely to be used on the East Coast as it is on the West Coast. But that's not okay with the Mover team. They want to make sure that the, they can still deliver a local experience. They can still get fast reads, even if they have to trade off some a right performance to do that. And this is what we're going to talk about for um, this demo. The new features that unlock this new pattern that let the Mover team get fast reads, local reads, even when the data itself isn't inherently uh, tied to a geography. Um, I'll pause there and see if there are any uh, questions I, before yeah, we jump I mean, in. There's one, one quick one here, Nate. Yep. I, I don't know if you're going to cover this or not, but it, it has to do with uh, you in the first line here. Yep. I'm, I'm paraphrasing what the, what the person had said. Um, you talked about being able to partition or geo partition this data into a particular uh, region, yep. right? Um, how does that work within, within CockroachDB? Yeah, sure. So when the mover team creates a uh, cluster, mm -hmm. right, each one of these nodes is tagged with some information that says where that node is in, in physical space. So um, the East Coast nodes would be tagged with a, the specific availability zone, but al also the specific region. Wow. That's the first part. Um, the second part is uh, creating the, the partitions themselves, where we're saying any record that has a, a city as a prefix, so if it's New York as a prefix, we're mapping that into a partition called East. 
and yeah. any um, record that has central or that has say Chicago as a city prefix, we're gonna map it to the central partition and so on. And the third piece is zone configurations. And that's the rules that are the flexible set of rules that say, hey, any data or any record you see that matches a particular partition, pin it to um, nodes that match these rules. So pin it to a particular region, a particular availability zone. You can even go down to a particular type of a disk if there's um, certain data that you don't need to. And that's just all done SSDs. via tagging, right? You exactly. would tag that node as like US East, but with like really killer disk. Exactly. Yeah. It's, um, tags and rules is that's what cool. uh, makes this And then, um, so basically what you're saying is then, so all rides and users that are in New York are going to US East, and that's all basically automated by the database to to tip to pin that information to the east. Yep, correct. That's cool. And then, um, are you doing at the at the create table time, or is that kind of done after the fact? So the partitions, you can do it at the create table time, but you can also add a partition after the fact. And again, the the zone configs you can do after the fact. As and you well. can modify those. And, yep. And that's awesome. Without any changes to the table or indexing or anything, it's just basically you're changing zone configs and, and you can redirect your data to different parts of the cluster. Exactly, and, and for this, uh, for the demo, I'll actually show how we uh, update the zone configs without necessarily having to change the-, the That's table. awesome, cool. I didn't want to interrupt too much, but I think I, yeah, I covered the question pretty well. All right, perfect. So, so let's drill in a little bit more on the, the promo codes. So this is the promo code table that we're using for Mover. Um, it has all of the fields that you'd expect. So you have the code itself as the key, description, creation time, expiration date when the code is no longer active, and then some rules that just govern how the promo code comes into play when you're um, starting a ride, for example. And while the structure of the table is uh, important, what's also important is how the table is being accessed. What are the, the access patterns that the uh, mover team is seeing for these transactions? So. Um, there are three real transactions that touch this table. The first is when you're creating a new code. So you can think about the mm -hmm. marketing team every week or every month decides to do a new campaign. That happens really infrequently. But um, what does happen frequently are when the users are actually using these promo codes. They're applying them to their account. They're being used every time they start a ride when the, the mover client or the mover server has to say, okay, how does this promo code apply to this ride? That lookup happens all the time. And so what the mover team is trying to do is figure out how can we make these frequent transactions as fast as possible? Yep. And that's what I'm gonna show in this, uh, in this demo. So to do this, we are going to- You're gonna, you're gonna go forward in a slide somehow. Yeah, somehow. <laughs> All right, there we go. There we go. Okay, so to get local reads on this promo codes table, we're gonna, we're gonna do three things. Uh, the first is creating indices are creating multiple indices for this promo codes table. So we have the original data and we're going to replicate it uh, multiple times using these uh, indices. And we're using in indices for this because we also wanna make sure that anyone who's reading this is reading a consistent view of those promo codes. The, the index creation and um, updates in CockroachDB is always consistent. So if uh, marketing, if the marketing team decides to expire a promo code and change the rules, that's going to happen consistently across the entire uh, cluster. So we're going to create these indices, and then we're going to start using some of the CockroachDB specific functionality. Um, we're going to use the zone configurations to pin each one of the indices to a particular region. So we'll have an index on the East Coast, Central, and West. And then that's it. With 19.1, we have an optimizer, a cost-based optimizer that's aware of the location of these indices. And it's going to use that to figure out which client should talk to what, which index, and that's going to give them a very fast uh, local experience. So you're going to pin uh, each code, you're going to use an index, pin it to a region. Yep. And the cost-based optimizer is going to know that that happened and basically rearrange everything and optimize each of the queries that are happening on within the different regions. Yep, it's gonna know that the, the index was pinned, it's gonna know where it was pinned, and it's going to know where the request was coming from. It's awesome. And um, that's how that'll work. So just to quickly recap how a cost-based optimizer works, um, what they do is they take your queries, they look at thousands of ways to evaluate them, and then they look at statistics and other characteristics of the table to try to figure out what is the plan that's going to have the, the best performance. And with CockroachDB, we really wanted to build this from the ground up to not just look at the characteristics of the table, but where in physical space this data is and use that to inform the, the planning. And that's what's going to um, enable this new pattern. 
Okay, so let's jump to the demo. If I can hide this Zoom screen. How do I hide this thing? There's a little toolbar that is blocking my tabs. All right, there we go. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is the uh, mover uh, cluster with the nine nodes spread across the continental United States. And if we look at the latency that we're seeing, um, the mover team is getting around 40 milliseconds for their tail latency. So 99% of queries are um, happening under 40 milliseconds. And that's okay, but the mover team can do much uh, better with CockroachDB. And for this one, we're going to, to drill into a, a statement and see what's one of the, the big factors that is uh, making this latency so high. So what we're looking at here is the uh, statement details for one of these promo code queries. This is a point lookup that's saying, hey, give me some um, metadata about the promo codes where the promo code ID equals, in this case, would say it's spring 19. But there's um, a couple things to point out here. The first is that the mean service latency for this point lookup in their current cluster is uh, around 40 milliseconds, which is just too high. That is clearly going across the United States to return that value. If this was a local read, we'd expect that to be in a, under a couple milliseconds. Okay, so that's just to go get the promo code across the country. That's yeah. exactly that's the cost here. So, and you can see if we're looking at this logical plan, um, right now it's saying it's going to use the primary index. And it's going to say, where is the authoritative replica for the promo code that this particular query is looking for? And if that code is not close, it is going to um, have a huge latency um, cost. And is this logical plan also new in 19.1? Yes, so with CockroachDB 19.1, um, in addition to making some great updates with the optimizer, we've also made it much easier to uh, troubleshoot the performance of your queries. And so, to do that, we started introducing logical plans into the UI. This is a point lookup, so the plan's not very interesting, but if you're thinking about some plans that have um, um, aggregations and other types of more uh, complicated uh, structures, this will help you navigate and understand what's happening. Yeah, they get really, really complex. Yes. I knew the answer. You yep. know that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Absolutely. Okay, so um, let's see how the mover team can fix this. So. Um, right now, we are connected to that cluster that I showed before, and we're going to do two things. The first, hold on, this Zoom thing. Let me see if I can hide that a little bit. Okay, great. The first thing we're going to do is create the indices, and then we're going to apply the zone constraint. So I'm, I'm going to walk through what's happening here. So right now, what we're doing is we're creating an index called uh, promo codes US East, uh, Central, and West. Um, these are what's called uh, covering indices, and this is represented by this uh, storing um, syntax. And what this is just saying is make sure that when we're creating the index, all of the data that is needed to actually answer the question is stored in the, the index itself. So at no point do we have to go to the, the underlying table. So we created three indices. And then this is where the, the CockroachDB uh, specific functionality comes in. We're saying for each one of these indices, and again, now we have three copies of this data, we want to constrain it, right? So promo code US East, we want to constrain it to nodes that, as I mentioned, were tagged with this region, US East 1. We want to constrain Central to nodes that were tagged with US Central, and same thing for the West Coast. And so behind the scenes, what CockroachDB is doing is it's um, taking all the data, looking at the rules, um, or it, the rules that we specified, and making sure the, the right data is in the right place. Right. So, so kind of two levels of performance increase here, not only just like moving the data around, but the storing thing is actually a huge increase in performance as well. We don't have to look within the table itself. Yeah, you, you'll, you'll need to have storing so the optimizer can actually take advantage of it because if uh -huh. it's not there, you still have to go into the um, table. Into the table. Well, the great. thing is, the, the adding the index itself does impose a cost, right? Mm -hmm. Writes are going to be slightly more expensive because they have to be written to, to more places. But the key insight here is that this, is, uh, this data is written very infrequently. So we're willing to do that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So you, you make the trade-offs in your architecture and how you actually deploy 
cockroach based on how you need things to perform across reads and writes in different regions and XYZ. Exactly. That's awesome. So now let's go back to our um, latency dashboard and we can see the, the impact is starting to, to show up here. Oh, wow. So it's a huge drop. Exactly. We started off in the 50 millisecond range and now we're around uh, 11 milliseconds, which, which is great. But um, what I want to show you, it'll, it'll take a second for everything to rebalance, but I have a cluster that where this rebalancing has already taken place. And you can actually see um, what the optimizer is doing here. So before, when we looked at this point lookup, it was going to um, the, the primary table or the, the primary right. index. And now we can see for this client that is accessing mover from the West Coast, it's actually going to this West Coast That's index. Awesome. And as we'd expect, if we look at the service latency, now we're under two milliseconds. So that is a local read for this promo code for these users. And that's why you saw that huge drop in performance or increase in performance. But maybe we got lucky. Maybe that promo code just happened to be in the, the West Coast. But let's see what's happening in Central. Same thing, local, this is local read. This yeah. read is under a millisecond, 700 microseconds. This is local performance here, uh, East Coast. Same thing, under two milliseconds. So with that simple change, we didn't have to update the application. We just took advantage of um, some of the features in CockroachDB and we brought our latency down by almost the order of magnitude. And the cost-based optimizer just auto of automated that. I mean, it's just basically automated that complete performance increase, huge, massive increase. Exactly. So let's just recap what we just saw. That is awesome. All right. So. As I mentioned, we saw what the mover team was trying to do here, but the, the bigger takeaway here is that with CockroachDB, we have many different patterns for uh, getting the performance and resiliency goals that you care about. And with CockroachDB 19.1, we've added some features to the cost-based optimizer to unlock even new patterns. Um, again, we saw this happen with no application updates and absolutely no downtime, which is also worth, worth talking about. A lot of times, if you want to do a big change like this, you're gonna to have to schedule downtime. You're gonna to have to plan for this downtime, but CockroachDB has two things. One, um, no downtime schema changes, which is huge. That let us do the create indices online, but also um, if you're doing upgrades or anything, there's no single point of failure, which would, re um, which would make you bring your app offline. So no app updates or downtime. But my, my favorite point about this is it shows some of the the benefits of rethinking some of these traditional database concepts. What would it mean to build a cost-based optimizer in 2019? You wouldn't just be looking at the tables, you'd be looking at where the data is in physical space and using that to inform your, your planning. So that's the demo. Yeah. Uh, the mover team is obviously uh, very happy now. And uh, I'll pause to see- I think their customers are happy. Yes. Their customers <laughs> are happy, exactly. exactly. And like some boss at Mover, who is you, basically, you're CEO of Mover. Right? I am CEO of Mover. Exactly. <laughs> the, um, yeah, I think it's interesting too to think through like, you know, I think the future of data, like we start to really like project ourselves five to 10 years out. Locality becomes a huge, massive, important piece of, of I think just data in general. I think like all data needs time and location eventually. Exactly, and, and if you think about how people are, are solving that today, the, the standard way to do this would be, you know, starting a shard, right? Yeah, yeah. we're gonna keep data close, but now we're gonna have these independent clusters that don't talk to each other and good luck trying to tie that out when it's reporting time. Right, or, yeah. or rebalance or I mean, reshard the whole thing. It's just, yeah. Uh, yeah, or do what we did. Try doing what we did in a sharded database. Yep. Difficult exactly. at best, right? Um, there was one question that came through. You'd mentioned um, upgrades as well. Um, I'll paraphrase here. Does CockroachDB also have rolling upgrades? Uh, yes, it does. So if you, you, know, if you have a, a database that has, or a cluster that has at least three nodes, you can do an upgrade by upgrading each one of those nodes um, one at a time, and you don't ever actually have to bring your uh, application offline. Um, one exciting benefit of this structure is that for all of our friends who are using Kubernetes to manage their CockroachDB uh, cluster, you can take advantage of some of the Kubernetes upgrade functionality, yep. and they can do rolling upgrades using Kubernetes in a really nice, and again, no downtime way. Yeah. It makes, it, it still matches that architecture so very well. Like it's the same concept within Kubernetes too, right? You just kill pods, well, let's kill nodes and it rebalances, bring nodes back on. It, it automates all that rebalancing. It's just a huge piece of what we do, so. Exactly. Well, cool. Well, thank you, Nate. That was a, uh, that was a great demo. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna foreshadow the last slide of this presentation, but we're gonna have a demo coming up in I think about a week or so 
um, talking through some of the things we did for CDC within 19.1 as well. Um, should be equally compelling content um, from Roland, who's one of our, our product managers here, works for Nate. Um, he's, he's a regular on our webinars here, or he's becoming a regular, right? So, um, so we've done a lot in 19.1. Um, you know, it is a substantial release for us. I think there was a lot of like, I think we did a lot of stuff for performance in this release. We, a lot of stability stuff we, we still continue to push forward with while we, while we move forward with a lot of the enterprise type features. Um, you know, some of the, some of the additional things that we've done, adding um, capabilities to do encryption at rest. So as data just lies, uh, making sure we th that we can encrypt. Um, you know, we're, we're always pushing the bounds of performance. Um, you know, in the last release, running TPCC um, uh, at the 10K warehouses on only 15 nodes, um, that was a big actually increase from us because, you know, the last time we did this, it was a couple dozen nodes, which means, you know, we're getting better through, we're getting better throughput um, on each of the CPU. And so that's a huge, massive increase. If you look at it, it's like about a 40% increase in, in, in throughput, right? And so, um, you know, we're really proud of that. We're, we're constantly pushing there as well. Another one here is a uh, load blaze spinning. I, you know, I know we were talking about this before, yep. Nate. Do you want to just kind of comment on what that means? I mean, it's kind of a new term for a lot of people. It's, it is unique to... Uh, it's uh, distributed to SQL yeah. and unique to us, so. So um, just for some background, the way CockroachDB works is it takes your data, it breaks it up into 64 megabyte um, chunks called ranges, and then it replicates those ranges um, three times by default among the nodes in your cluster. Uh, one of the issues that people would run into when they were getting started with CockroachDB is they'd have, say, a 10 node cluster, but their data set would only be, um, un it'd be under 64 megabytes. So they'd start putting all this load on, the, uh, on their uh, cluster, but they weren't seeing the performance improvements that they yep. want. And they started adding nodes and they weren't seeing the performance improvements that they wanted. And what was happening behind the scenes is that the, the data was still ultimately becoming, or there were hotspots that were getting created because- Overloading. Day, exactly, yeah. there was only one authoritative replica for, for that data set. And so what we're doing with uh, load-based splitting is we're saying, um, for each one of the ranges, we're looking at the traffic that that range is uh, getting. And after a certain um, threshold, we'll actually split the range. We can automate the splitting. We'll of automate that. the splitting yeah. of the range. So eventually, with enough traffic, the cluster, each one of those nodes would have a smaller piece of that range, mm -hmm. that original range. And then you would start to see the, the horizontal scalability without any manual work on um, on the, the developer yeah. side. Yeah, I mean, it's huge for, you know, complete, you know, just overall utilization of the cluster across the board and, and, and minimizing kind of spikes or, or big, big, big lows in that. Exactly. And, and the, the other feature that complements this, of course, now is load or is uh, range merging. So mm -hmm. if you do a bunch of deletes and you have a bunch of em empty uh, ranges, we can actually merge those to, together. As That's well. the other so, side of it. Yes, exactly. Exactly, right? Um, there was a follow up to the encryption at rest um, question. Yep. Um, and so we added that feature. Um, what are we doing for uh, protecting data in motion uh, as it as it floats, you know, between nodes or out, you know? Yeah. So um, for encryption at flight, by default, we use a TLS 1.2 encryption. So that's just the standard way to connect to um, or connect CockroachDB nodes together. This, in some databases, is an enterprise feature for um, encryption in flight. That's that's a standard out of the box feature mm -hmm. for us. If you think about why that's a standard feature, it's because going back to Jim's point, we're building a distributed system. The, the nodes are going yeah. to be over the network and we wanna make sure that uh, communication is secure. So um, by default, we use a TLS, TLS 1.2. Yeah. Yep. Cool, awesome. So that was some of the more general things. And then again, we're always you know, focused on, you know, the, we, you know, we haven't just like built Postgres on top of a distributed system. We haven't done just like, hey, we speak SQL and then it's something totally, we actually have a SQL execution engine underneath the thing too, right? Which we've been building for a couple of years and the cost-based optimizers. So a couple of things here that we've done as well. Um, I think the logical query plans and the web UI, I, I foreshadowed that one. We kind of saw that Nate showed you that, um, but query plans can get extremely complex and having the insight, giving DBAs and, and other people who are concerned about, you know, performance impacts um, to really be able to investigate those things, uh, it, it's, it's phenomenal. And it's, it's a huge, huge increase in, in capability of what we do. Um, but there's all this thing around, you know, the, we'll come back to the query optimizer. I don't want to talk too much about that, but the follower reads thing, right? Yep. Um, we can now do queries as of a system timestamp and whatnot. Can you describe that one as well, Nate, a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
The follower reads is another feature that we could have demoed um, in this one because it unlocks yet another uh, design pattern. So um, what follower reads does is it lets you, instead of going to that authoritative replica that I mentioned in our docs is called the, the leaseholder, um, it lets you ask a question from the replica that's physically closest to you. And there is a trade-off in doing that because while we still maintain consistency of the data, it's consistency at an older snapshot. So if you say, um, I wanna read a particular piece of data as of a certain system time, so say 40 seconds in the past or a minute in the past, we can say, okay, this is old enough where we're still sure we can get a consistent snapshot. So instead of making you do a, a hop across the United States or across the world, we can serve that read from the, the closest replica to you. So going back to our mover example, um, we could have used this for promo codes if we didn't care about the consistency of promo codes. If we wanted a best effort, then we could have used follower reads to get a similar uh, improvement in performance. So lots of different options to accomplish various different levels of performance and very different, various different levels of uh, distribution of data. Right? Yep. So lots of different things we could do. Um, actually, there was, there was a follow-up to, the, to, the, to the, um, the way we actually split range. And so when we do split range, um, when we actually redistribute, are they redistributed intelligently to nodes where that data is being accessed? Yeah, so there is, um, there's a hierarchy for how we actually redistribute nodes. The exact hierarchy, I may uh, get wrong, but <laughs> we have, um, so we have specific rules that you can create, right? So those are some of the things that we talked about. We wanna keep um, data that has this particular characteristic on a particular machine. That's, right. that's one set of rules. Um, but in general, CockroachDB will um, distribute the data to maximize uh, geodiversity because we wanna make sure, for example, if you have a, a three node cluster, you don't have two ranges on the same node. We wanna make sure that we're maximizing the survivability of the, the cluster itself. So that's the way that the um, replicas will be rebalanced. Um, but again, this is something where you should look at the docs. We also have intelligent things like um, this feature called follow the workload where we can move the authoritative replica to where the, yeah. um, where the queries are coming from. And we can also move ranges as well. So that's a long way of saying we do a lot of intelligent yeah. things behind the scenes to put the data where it's supposed to be, but you can um, tune that based off your application. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So I think there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of work and a lot of late nights and a lot of, uh, a lot of like major strategic thought around those kind of things. So yeah. And we have really great documentation. So if you want to go deep there, uh, please check out our docs. Yeah. Jesse and the team does an amazing job <laughs> yes. describing those things. So, well, cool. Those were some of the key features. Um, you know, there is a longer blog post on our website at cockroachlabs.com um, on our blog about 19.1 that gets into some, I don't know, there's like 30 or some features that we actually listed in there. So um, if anybody wanted to actually get a little bit more information uh, about the, the release in total, um, that's a really good place to actually go look. Um, and again, the docs in our release notes are, are pretty verbose and, and pretty descriptive of, of not just what we've done, but, but how to use these things as well. And so we would encourage people to, to go off and do that as well. Um, and so, you know, we, like I said, you know, as before, um, you know, we are pushing forward across the, all this, uh, everything that we do across all these, these gold, these colored boxes here to make sure that, you know, what we're doing from a distributed SQL point of view will actually meet the needs of what, what organizations need to do with data um, for their kind of, you know, their, their most high valued, uh, you know, trusted transactional workloads, right? And so I asked a lot of the questions, actually, we got it, we had a fair amount. And so I asked them all in line. I don't know if there was any more or less. No, that's it. So, um, so with that, I, I, you know, I were done with, but thank you, Nate. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. And thank you everyone who joined in for the uh, webinar. Cool. All right. Uh, so one last thing, I mentioned this before. Um, one last feature that we wanted to highlight from 19.1 that's actually pretty awesome. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about change data capture that is next week. Um, Roland uh, from the product team will be joining me on that one. So we invite you all for that as well. And then finally, an email with the replay link will be sent to everybody. And please, please, please um, complete the survey so we can get better at these things. But I hope everybody found this useful today. And on behalf of Nate, he already thanked you, but I'll thank you again. Thanks everybody for taking time from their, from their busy day to uh, come join us here. And we're excited working with everybody. Thank you so much. Bye now.